It's like playing D&D. Is the roof made of stone? No? Alrighty. Going through the roof. Hey, thanks for joining the Escape With Me book club. Escape with me, Lizzie Sawyer. And me, Sam Reiner. Into our most recent read. Come with us as we solve a mystery and go into detail about a new book. We're going to be discussing it from cover to cover, beginning to end. So remember, there will be spoilers. Today we're going to River Heights. Published in 1930, the original Nancy Drew books took the world by storm. At the time, a man named Edwin Straitmeyer hired writers for $125 a book to write the manuscripts, starting with Mildred Weirt Benson under the pseudonym Carolyn Keene. This book was later rewritten in 1959 by Harriet Adams, and that is the backstory of Nancy Drew and how they got started and how they've always had ghostwriters. I thought that was super interesting. Versus, which we'll get into the book cover in a second, versus the actual summary of the book, which you can tell by just looking at it. But I owned a lot of these books as a kid in, yeah. in random order. I don't think I ever had the first one. I think I started with Secrets of Shadow Ranch. That's a good one. I like that one. And I can't remember what other ones. I just had a bunch of random ones. I don't know why I collected them like that, but it's how it goes, you know. I must have just seen the cover and thought that one was an interesting cover, and then I bought that one. I honestly can't remember buying any of them. I can just remember owning them and having them in my house and trying to read them. But it it was a series I wished I was more into than I actually was. The reverse hipster, I guess. Trying desperately to be part of the mainstream of all these people that like Nancy Drew. But it wasn't until I started playing the Her Interactive Nancy Drew game that I got really, really into her and I was able to read her books and be super excited about all of them. I think it's a series where I would have liked it a lot more if they were read to me versus reading them by myself. Reasons that I listen to audiobooks. That's fair. I've never thought about it like that. My background is pretty similar with these books. I didn't really get into them until I started playing the Nancy Drew games and started to actually want to know more about the books behind the games. But I did start with this book. So to judge the book by its cover, like I mentioned earlier, it's exactly what you think it is. There's Nancy Drew on the cover, looking over her shoulder in a, some sort of time crunch, worried about people catching her. She has a clock and a screwdriver, and it's really obvious she's going to open the clock and there's going to be something inside of it. So maybe it's a treasure hunt of some sort, and this clock is really important, and that's basically what this book is. Kind of. For the most part. Can you remember Baby Lizzie? What Baby Lizzie thought of this? No, first time I read this was in high school. Oh, never mind. But Baby Lizzie didn't know this book existed. <laughs> I liked a lot reading through the first couple of times, and I have read through them more than once, partly because the mysteries are decent and partly because the audiobook is actually really good. The way that it's read, the narrator is really nice, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head because it's been about a week since I've read this book. But I mean, I liked the mystery in this. I liked the different characters and the fact that Nancy was actually a independent 18-year-old who could actually do things like change a tire and fix a motor and climb stuff and pick locks. That was very awesome for me at the time. She's a pretty responsible 18-year-old at that, too. Yeah, and this is the rewritten version, too, where they make her 18. I think before it was rewritten, she was, like, what, 16 or so? Yeah. In the original, she is 16. Apparently in 1930, that's when you're a high school graduate. But when they rewrote it in 1959, you were 18 and a high school graduate. So they just moved that up to modernize it. Which meant that she was a very responsible 16 year old. We'll get into that. We'll definitely be talking about some of the differences between the original and the rewrite. Okay. Now we join Nancy as she drives down the street in her new car as she notices a van driving at high speeds while a small child runs into the road, which is an amazing opener. I was not expecting such an action-packed opening because you start off and it's very Nancy with her blonde hair and blue eyes is very gorgeous driving down the road. Oh, I should thank dad for my new car. And then next page, there's a small child running into a road in front of a truck and you're freaking out. And in the audiobook, it plays suspenseful music. Which just adds to the glory. But I thought it was really, really good opening. It's very action-packed. Yes. Which is something in the entire book. The rewrite has more action scenes and it's at a much faster pace, which I think is something that really lends itself to continuously motivate you. Because she does a lot of random side things, but then there are a lot of action scenes that glue it together as well. I don't know if 
I could have handled some of the scenes if they were slower paced. So Nancy in the rewrite is more sugar, less spice. Because in the original, she is, I guess that's the best way to put it, she's more spicy. She's got more feist in her. Later on at the will reading, she's so happy to dethrone the Toppums because she hates new money. They're not like old money who deserve being rich and things like that. Wow. Yeah. There are a lot of things that I probably would have liked seeing her more spicy, but there are certain things like that where I'm just glad they changed it and made it Nancy super happy to be able to help these people instead of, ha, new money. You don't deserve your money. Yeah, they do. I don't... I don't know if I would describe that as spicy as much as pompous rich kid. Really, though. This must have been a really big issue in the 1930s because there are a lot of big novels that talk about new money, old money. Things like The Great Gatsby come to the mind. It was a really good one where it was old money versus new money and just a bunch of random books like that. I don't understand. (laughs) And we're not from the 1930s. Mainly because I have no money. (laughs) Be like, ah, money. I wish I knew what that was like. It's hard to be hating on new versus old money when you don't have any to begin with. So it doesn't matter. Just happy to be middle class and comfortable. (laughs) Yeah, I sure would love to hate on one of these guys, but you know what? I could just hate them both. I have a house... I have a family. We're good. (laughs) We made it. We're here. That's all that matters. (laughs) So that is one thing that changes is Nancy Drew's personality changes a little bit more. She gets more help from her father in the rewrite than the original. In the original, she's less reliant on her father's opinion. But I don't I don't think that was a bad change. I kind of like the dynamic between Carson and Nancy. I think it's pretty realistic to have the expert lawyer also involved in the will because he knows all the law stuff versus Nancy who can do all the legwork and the mystery stuff. It's a really good dynamic. Yeah, and the father-daughter dynamic is really good until you hit the end where she's like, I did this dangerous thing and he's like, good job. Don't do that dangerous thing. And I'm like, no, no, it needs to be don't do that dangerous thing and then maybe a good job. We don't congratulate for dangerous thing. (laughs) We congratulate for coming out on the other side of Dangerous Thing. I don't know. Sometimes I get the feeling that Carson sees himself, like a younger himself and Nancy. And so it makes me wonder what dangerous things he was doing at that age. Because what mysteries have you been solving? Probably very similar dangerous things, if not worse. It makes me curious. It's like, huh, did you leap out of burglar's cars at 18, Carson? Hmm. Did you get locked in closets and left to starve at 18, Carson? What is happening here? Just while we're on Carson, something that threw my brain for a loop. Because through all the books I've read and through all of the games I've played, I've always imagined Carson as clean shaven because he just seems to have that personality. I can't explain it. He just seems like he would be clean shaven. Except there's a page... In this book, they have a bunch of illustrations. And on one of the illustrations, he has a mustache. Or at least I assume that's Carson, because the other dude in the picture is, like, really old. So I don't think that was here. But Carson has a mustache. And I've read this book so many times, and I keep forgetting that, because it just slips off my mind. My mom is like, this is not accurate. Shove out of brain. And so every time I come to that page in the book, I get surprised again that Carson has a mustache. Yeah, I had forgotten too until you brought it up again. (laughs) He looks really good. He's very handsome, but I just wasn't expecting a mustache. That feels important enough to bring up in our podcast and spend precious seconds on it. I did think it was interesting that Carson was initially super supportive of Nancy's detective work, where Hannah was on the other end going, please don't do anything dangerous. Please don't. Please be careful. Please don't do anything dangerous. Immediately does dangerous things. But it made me love that dynamic even more because Carson wasn't holding Nancy back at any point. He's just being very helpful to her. Yeah. They seem like a team, and I really like it, considering this book doesn't really have Helen Corning in it as her sidekick, and we don't get Bess and George until, I think, the fourth book. So it's kind of nice that she has a little partner in Carson in this first book. Let's talk about the different, I guess, people who should have benefited from the will but did not benefit from the will. I don't know how you would classify that, but there are four... I count them as four groups. There's a bunch of characters, but they basically separate into four different categories. And so the first one is the Turner sisters plus Judy. These are the first people that 
that Nancy meets. Judy is the little girl that runs into the street, but manages to run across and is on a little bridge, but then falls over into the creek below. And so Nancy's freaking out. And Little girl needs to get hurt, but not necessarily hit by car hurt. Yeah. That big a truck. Yeah. Because it was a moving van. Yep. Moving way too fast. We're going to hurt the girl. We're not going to squish her. So she lands in the creek below and she kind of gets knocked out. But Nancy sees that no water entered her mouth or nose. And she's probably just going to have a concussion. But at that time, they didn't know what concussions were. So she was just going to have a bruise on her head. A mild concussion. Yes. Which, reading older books and when a character gets hit on their head. God, they have a mild concussion now. We're just going to ignore that entirely. All right, moving on. They're totally fine now. It's so weird. Like, I feel dizzy. Yeah, that's the concussion. I feel dizzy. Well, gonna go do this other thing now, like I'm perfectly normal. I feel kind of woozy and I can't do much, but I'll be fine. No. No, you won't. Stop. Lay down. Don't sleep. <laughs> Don't sleep. I've had a couple of concussions before, but one was super bad and it lasted. So the concussion itself was pretty bad for the first couple of days. And then it lasted for about a month or two because concussions take a really long time to actually heal. But it was day three of my concussion and people would come up to me. They'd ask me, why are you wearing sunglasses? Because I hit the front and the back of my brain. So my frontal lobe, so it hurt to think. And my occipital lobe, so I had light sensitivity. And so I was wearing sunglasses and people would keep coming up to, up to me at a work thing and be like, hey, why do you have glasses on? And I was like, oh, I got in a car crash earlier this week. I have a concussion. And the first instinct would be don't sleep i'm like it is 72 hours later how do you think i would have managed to not sleep this long <laughs> don't sleep sleep and you're dead but that was the first instinct i was like oh yeah i got a concussion three days ago don't sleep okay three days ago let me repeat <laughs> But she picks up Judy and she carries her to the house. And Nancy's just very patient. She's very sweet to Judy and all these things. There was one excerpt, though, that made me laugh really hard. Because as she's carrying the child, the author felt it appropriate to label it as Nancy carried her little burden. And I laughed so hard at that. That didn't even register with me. It was funny because it was like this whole time she's like caring about this kid. It's like, oh, no, she's so small. She's so worried about her and she picks her up and she's carrying her. He's like, my little burden. Let me carry my little burden. So we meet the Turner sisters and they are the most sympathetic case because it's these two little old ladies and they spent the entirety of their younger life caring for their niece whose mother died and then the niece grew up and she started having a family and she had Judy and then she died and then Judy's parents died. And so these aunts are taking care of Judy now. And I mean, they're elderly. And back then, this was before things like Social Security or really any savings for retirement was a cultural thing. And so the only money they make is from the work they do as seamstresses. But they're older, and so they have a hard time seeing stuff, and their fingers aren't as nimble as they used to be. So they're getting less and less income as it comes along. But Judy, obviously, is getting older and older, and so she's going to be more and more expensive. And they really, really really want to send her to college because she's a very smart and bright child, but they know they will never be able to afford that. They're probably going to be lucky to make ends meet. And in fact, the moving truck that Nancy saw was them selling off some old furniture so they would able to pay their bills. I was so sad. They're a good little family. <laughs> These ladies deserve so much. They've spent so much of their life caring selflessly for other people's kids because the goodness of their heart. Although one thing that didn't make sense is they mentioned because they took care of their niece, they didn't get married. And in my brain, it would have been better to get married because then you have two people, I mean, theoretically four people working to bring an income for this one child. Why did this stop them from getting married? I don't know. That's something you'd have to ask the ghostwriter about. Because th that was something else is they gave up being able to get married and having a family of their own and it would have been better. Especially when you meet them later on and they are making their bills. They're doing fine. So I didn't understand that. That was something I was confused on. But they bring up the two mystery elements. They find out after the moving trucks left that silver pieces are missing. And so 
the people that bought the furniture also stole from them. So now Nancy has to track them down. And then there's also the case of the missing will, or the missing second will, of Josiah Crowley, who promised a bunch of relatives when he passed away that he would be giving them a ton of money. And when he finally did pass away, he gave everything to the Tophams, who are the Nouveau Riche. They don't really play that up in the book, so I guess by 1959, people were over whether it was old or new money. But they're already rich people in the book. Basically, it comes across that they don't need the money as much as all of these poor relatives that can use it to do things like survive and send children to college and be able to pursue careers and things like that. The Tophams also aren't very nice people, just in general. They are not. They're very pompous and self-righteous. Except for Mr. Topham. Mr. Topham comes across to me as the least terrible. Yep. But then again, we don't really see too much of him. Yep. The one time we see him, later on, Nancy is pretending to sell, well, I mean, she is selling charity tickets, but she's using it as an excuse to get into the Topham's house, and Mr. Topham basically walks into the room, says, I'll take four of them, and then sits down and reads the newspaper. And then you see him again at the will reading, and he brings in a lawyer. I don't think he says anything that entire scene. I think just his wife says something. And the two girls. I can't remember. I don't think he said anything there either. But going back to the Turner sisters, something that didn't make sense to me. Again, there are plenty of things that don't make sense to me. When we get to finding out about the silver being stolen, Nancy offers to phone the police. But the Turner sisters say that their phone is out of order, right? Right. That's why Nancy has to drive all the way to a police station and lose precious time trying to track them down. The next day, Nancy phones the Turner sisters about Judy's condition, and they answer and tell her, I thought their phone was out of order. I completely missed that reading through. I'm sure a lot of people do, but I was sitting there taking notes of, okay, I made like a special note about the phone to be like, okay, that's a cool way to be like, Nancy, go do the thing. And then the next chapter, Nancy phones them about Judy's condition. Judy was doing fine. They really hoped that she could find something about the silver, and I think they mentioned the will again. What? What? Wait. <laughs> oh, well. So the next group is the Hoover sisters, Grace and Allison Hoover. They are not relatives of Josiah Crowley, but they were their neighbors, the Crowley's neighbors, when Mrs. Crowley was alive. When she passed away, Mr. Crowley sold the farm and just lived with a bunch of random relatives. And the Hoover sisters own a very small farm because their parents got very sick and their sickness took away all of their life savings and then the parents passed passed away. And so now they have this very small farm and they don't have a lot of furniture. They don't have a lot of niceties doing the best they can to make ends meet. And in the original, the Hoover sisters wanted the money because they wanted to get better at hatchery and dressmaking. But in the rewrite, they really want the money because they want Allison to take voice lessons so she can pursue a singing career. It's her dream. And I'm not sure which one I like better. I like the idea of these two girls really taking to this farm life and doing it themselves and wanting to improve themselves. But I also kind of like the idea that Allison doesn't want to be a farmer forever and wants to be famous and is able to to pursue her own thing. I can't decide which one I like better. They're both good. Yeah, and they're both good in different ways. So I don't know, take your pick on that one. I don't think that's a point in either of their favor. I think both of them are pretty good. And then the third group is the least sympathetic, in my opinion. The only two men, this is Fred and William Matthews. These were the dudes that wanted to marry the Turner sisters, which a little weird because, but I guess not. But anyway, they are also cousins of Josiah Crowley. Or no, they were, I don't remember what the connection was. It was like on his mother's side. I think they're cousins. Yeah. Anyway, that some sort of cousin. He basically goes into how all of these people are related to him and I couldn't keep him straight. I think the book would have been better served if they weren't in the book because their qualm is that they want to travel the world. Yep, that's the thing. That's the only thing. They're fine, really. They're just living their lives. Everyone else is literally trying to survive, and they're just over here making ends meet with this fruit farm. No, the person that needs the money the most is definitely the fourth person, which is that little old lady that's living by herself who doesn't even have anybody to check on her when she falls down the stairs and twists her ankle. Yeah, but the one thing I didn't get is why did we stick to this world traveling thing when it could have been super super cute if they needed the money to get married to the Turner sisters. 
Like they wanted to have a nice house and have enough money to marry them at the end. Or at least at least have some romantic tension when they all walk into the room with the will reading. I want a resolution for this. Why did they have the Turner sisters blush when they even thought of the Matthews and then never bring that up again? That could have been so cute. Because the writer forgot. Ugh. I just think it would have been better if it was they wanted to marry the Turner sisters, but they didn't have enough money to do that. That would have been much better than travel in the world. See, when we first started talking about Turner sisters, I thought it was Turner sisters, quote unquote, and they're actually a lesbian couple. No, because they wanted to get married to them. No, I know. I'm saying, but when we first met them, that's what I thought that it was. <laughs> that would have been very edgy for 1930 slash 1959. Yes, it would have, but that's what I thought it was. No, they are actually biological sisters and wanted to get married to some distant, really related cousins, but did, I don't know how that worked. But yes, you're right. The fourth person, Abby Rowan, and she is a super elderly woman, and she had recently fallen down the cellar stairs. And so when Nancy sees her, she has a swollen ankle and she's really malnourished and she only has a little bit of a pension check, probably from when her husband served in the military, to her name. And so when Nancy comes in, she buys her groceries, she goes to the pharmacy and takes care of her because Abby refuses to see a doctor because she can't pay for it and refuses to let Nancy pay for it. And then Nancy gets a neighbor to look in on her, but Abby really wants the money so she could have a live-in nurse to take care of her. Which she really needs. Really needs a live-in nurse for things like this. Exactly. She's just extremely elderly and she needs that extra attention. But she is extremely forgetful and one of the reasons Nancy comes to her is because at this point she's figured out that the Toppums don't know where the second will is, but they think there is one, so Nancy's been searching for one. She comes to Abby Rowan, who is getting very forgetful in her old age, to try to figure out if Josiah told her anything. That's why she's been going to all of these relatives, to figure out if Josiah had mentioned the one thing that would lead her to the next clue. And I am convinced Josiah never wanted his will to be found. Because of all people, why did Josiah tell the elderly woman who forgets everything about the notebook in the clock. Well, he died, so he had to, in theory, have been much older than Abby. Maybe, maybe not. It never really gets into it. He could have been younger than her and just had a heart attack or something. Still. And women typically live longer than men anyway. Yeah, that's true. So I was just, why of all people? You could have told the Turner sisters, you could have told the Hoover sisters, you could have told the Matthew brothers, but Abby, the forgetful one, he didn't actually want his will to be found. Yeah, clearly not. But let's talk about the Toppins real quick in a little bit more detail. So there's Ada and Isabel. So their stereotype is one of them is unattractive and the other one's attractive but dull. And they're the rich girls in school, but they're unattractive and nobody likes them. And so I'm kind of wondering when the stereotype flipped around to nowadays when you think of, oh, they're the rich people, they're pretty, and everybody loves them even though they're horrible. I don't know why that switched. Because I see that in a lot of these older books is the mean people are ugly and no one likes them. I don't think it actually ever said they were ugly. They were just... No, it straight up said Ada was unpleasant and when she frowned, she looked ugly. Okay, I don't remember that. I guess everyone just loves an underdog. Nancy goes to... I think she goes to buy a dress for a charity event? Was that why she went? Yes. So she goes to buy this dress and while they're there... Ada and Isabel are terrible and at one point they rip a dress and leave and then Nancy gets to get the dress at a discount and altered nicely so that it covers up the terror and it looks pretty. In the original, Isabel and Ada break a vase. Okay. All right. A point to the rewrite because Nancy gets an awesome dress out of this. I don't know. The original makes me think of the first time I met your husband. Oh dear. Opa! It's a good time. We're in a Cracker Barrel. And he put on his coat to leave, and by doing so, he knocked over a glass lamp and decided the appropriate thing to do in that situation is to scream Opa. 
Yeah, it is. Left quite an impression. On everybody. On everybody in the Cracker Barrel. Dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. That was a good time. I love that story. As we go on, we do these two mystery threads. And per usual, they intermingle at certain points. I'm kind of curious on your thoughts, though. Halfway through the book, the burglars change M.O. So they go from pretending to be furniture buyers and stealing silver stuff, to straight up breaking and entering into summer homes and taking all of the furniture. I can't blame them, really, because it's empty. They're already stealing. (laughs) Might as well. That's why I was sitting there wondering. They make it clear once they get arrested that they've been doing this around Moon Lake since forever. They decided that pretending to buy furniture wasn't as lucrative as straight up just stealing it from empty houses. Why were they stealing from empty houses and then decided, hey, we're gonna go pretend to be furniture buyers. I don't know. Does that seem realistic? Maybe I'm just nitpicking. They're criminals. I don't know. Fair. Fair. Don't have any first person experience with this. I don't actively go out and steal things, so I don't know. That's the whole thing with the clock, is there's a notebook in the clock. Abby finally remembers. Nancy pretends to be a... Okay, once again, she's not pretending because she actually does sell charity tickets. But she goes to the Topham's, she looks at the clock, she's like, oh, is that the Josiah's clock? And then Mrs. Topham is all upset because, no, his stuff is ugly. They're at their summer house. And then Ada invites Nancy to go to the summer house? I think she just wants to show off the stuff. She's like, yeah, we have such nice furniture at the summer house. You should look at it and be jealous of our furniture. I guess, because it, the exact phrasing was Nancy was doing all that to get to the summer house, whatever, and then it was as if Ada read Nancy's mind. She said, you should go to our summer house at some point. I'm like, you hate her. Okay, I will. <laughs> exactly. Why are you inviting her out? When you guys aren't even there, she wants her to go in the caretaker's hair and walk around their summer house. I guess you're right. It must be that she just wants to show off her furniture, but they make made it clear that it's a lot of Josiah's furniture and that it's ugly for them. Which is stupid because later on they're like, yeah, the furniture that Miss Topham actually confiscated from Josiah because she had to have it. Yeah, because she wanted all of his things. Because they were fancy and she liked them, but all right. Not enough to have in her own house, though. Her own house is an eclectic wreck. And speaking as someone who is eclectic, there's a limit. (laughs) Which, another thing I'm curious on your... You're more artistic than I am. But she mentions how the room is ugly because the carpets are red and the curtains are pink. And she says that they clash. Yeah, if you've got red carpets, and I think it would also depend on the colors of the walls. But with red carpets, you'd have to go with white for the walls. Well, maybe I've just been inducted in way too many Valentine's Days. I don't see pink and red clashing. But do they clash? Am I just really tacky? They can, depending on the hue of the red versus pink, like how much blue to yellow they have in them versus also how light the pink is versus how dark the red is. You can also overwhelm a room by doing that too. You end up making it quite dark, having pink curtains and and red carpets. And I only really know this because my sister had red carpets in her bedroom in the last house we had. So Nancy goes to the house and whatever and is being burglarized. She gets locked in a closet. And they leave her there to die. Yeah, and I kind of hate the door thing because I really wanted Nancy to bust out. If it's a big old wooden door, they're usually very thick and the locks on them are actually fairly sturdy. And so you're not really, especially in a small closet, going to be able to to get up enough momentum or weight, especially since she's a teenage girl who is fit. She doesn't have much chunk to her. She's not going to be able to bust through that door. I mean, yes, but at the end there, it was saying that the hindrance were giving way and then the caretaker runs over and slams against the door. And I mean, I guess that was confrontational, but it was a little, it felt melodramatic for her to do all this stuff just for the caretaker to let her out of the closet. Honestly, if it were me, since from the way it sounded when she pulled down the coat rod, it sounded like the walls were made out of drywall. It may have been easier if she decided to go through the wall instead. Could have been. Just because drywall would be easier to get through. 
true. Why were the Topham's hanging coats and stuff on nails when they had a closet rod? Well, she wasn't in the closet first time she was in a wardrobe to hide, and then they found her, and then put her in the closet. No, she was in the closet. I thought she was in a different closet, because the closet she's in when they lock her in there doesn't have anything in it, but they don't actually go into the thing she's in to get the stuff out in between uh, her hiding and her locking in the closet. No, it's the same closet, because that was the only one of the only things left in the room, because it was an office, it was the closet. And she didn't have enough things to hide under. But even when she's groping around looking for something to use, she almost tears her hand on a nail. And then she pulls down the coat rod. Why are they hanging things on nails? Just what? It felt silly and unnecessary. Anyway, one of the big things with the rewrite on Jeff Tucker, who is the caretaker, which is objectively better in the rewrite. Because in the original, Jeff Tucker is a racist stereotype. The old books and our token racist stereotypes. So they got rid of that and it's just objectively better because in this one they tricked him in a similar way and he got locked into a shed near the lake and I kind of wish that they mentioned how Jeff Tucker managed to get out because they completely gloss over it. It's just like, oh, I was locked there. Now I'm here. Maybe that would have been satisfying enough. There was a shed. The door probably wasn't as sturdy as a door in the house. Probably. Willing to bet. It would have been more satisfying. Also, he's a grown man, has more weight on him, and has more strength, and so probably has a better chance to burst a door open. I don't know. Looking at the picture of him, he looks very frail. Well, then the door must have just been weaker. Plus, he would if it was a shed, he probably had more room to get momentum to slam himself up against a door. Or had more tools. But it would have been nice to hear it. At least let somebody talk about how they got out of that. That would have been cool. It's like, yeah, they locked me in a shed, but they forgot that I had saws in here, so I just cut the door in half. That would have been awesome. So they once again do the whole go find police officers, go try to drive around. Nancy eventually finds them at an old inn. And in the original, it was prohibition. So to make them extra evil, they were getting drunk at a shady inn, so they were being extra illegal. Gotta have that extra illegal, man. You're gonna illegal, gotta be extra. We have to be true bad guys. You have to be the most, always. But when in the rewrite, they're just eating dinner, which is boring in comparison. (laughs) And then there's a part later on where the police, there are police chasing after them. And in the original, there is gunfire involved. In the other one, they just pull a tricky driving maneuver and make them run off the side of the road into a ditch. Which is honestly better. I don't know. It it would depend on how the scene was written. Because that could have been really exciting to have gunfire going off and all that. Yes. However, gunfire should be used as a last resort? Well, I mean, I think it was the robbers shooting at them and then then shooting back. Ah. So that's how they get them and and they're all good. Nancy snuck into the furniture truck and got out the clock. Basically stole it from the Steelers and in the original book, she hides it from the police, but in the rewrite, she tells the police that she has it and gives it back to them. So that's a point for the rewrite's favor. I stole this clock from the people that were stealing things. Here it is. (laughs) And she finds a notebook with a key inside for a safe deposit box. Nancy is able to figure it out which safe deposit box it is. They go there, they find the new will, and all of the people that we've met so far get all of the stuff that they need. And they find out that the estate is worth... 100000 after tax. And I was trying to figure out whether or not this would be in 1930 money or 1959 money, but I think it would... Ha- they must not have updated it from the 1930 version because in 1959, to adjust for inflation, that would be $800,000, which is a good amount. Yeah. But in 1930 money, it would have been... $1.5 million. And that feels much more accurate to how they were reacting to his estate. Yeah. So I'm just going to say he was worth $1.5 million. So every person gets 10%. The Hoover sisters get 20% because there's two of them. Abby gets 10%. The Matthews get 20 Edna and Mary get 20. Mr. Topham only gets 5%. And this is really bad because apparently he was going broke on stock losses, which would have been really relevant to 1930s, considering all going on. But he, he's been losing on the stock market and he was relying on the inheritance. So they end up having to give up their super fancy house and both daughters have to go to work now, which good. They clearly seem the type that need to work and 
humble themselves. So that was good. I am firm in my belief that everybody should spend a year in retail. Everybody. It's a happy ending in the end. Even though Josiah Crowley was really trying his best to not have his will found. There was also something where he wrote the second will himself. He's like, I didn't trust it to a lawyer. It's like, yeah, that would have been responsible. But he still got it witnessed by two people, but both people died before Josiah died, apparently. I just, oof, you are lucky. Lucky, a random 18 year old got interested in this. Otherwise, oof. So just some general thoughts on this. I think the chapter changes were really, really good. It was really nice pace. It made you want to read the next chapter. But it didn't feel so much like they were doing it to just lead you on into the next one. It didn't feel cheap. It felt real. But on the other hand, I do think an editor really needs to go back through this. Because the one we have is the 1980 reprint of the 1959 rewrite. Try to file that line. But even three redos later. They still have a lot of drunk punctuations. There are still a lot of typos or words missing. For example, I wrote down one that stuck out to me was on page 148 and it says, but surely there could no mistake. I feel like an editor needs to go back through this and clean it up a little bit. I didn't notice any mistakes because I listened to the audiobook. <laughs> True. Yeah, I bet that had that sentence be correct. Yes, they did. Another thought that kind of amuses me about Nancy is she seems to lack self-awareness sometimes. There was one scene where she was driving and she was looking at the scenery and it was very pleasant. And she straight up says, because I wrote it down verbatim because it made me laugh so much. Oh, why can't people be this pleasant and not cause trouble? You know, like breaking and entering or getting into car traces or sticking your nose into people's business or spying or Nancy all you do is cause trouble why are you saying you wish people didn't cause trouble because she's not very self-aware she's not it's very humorous how the lack of self-awareness that she has but what are your general thoughts on the book I think it's a decently well written mystery the, you don't really know where the wheel's gonna pop up and how she's possibly gonna find it until you get a little bit of a clue and then you're like ah oh, look we can follow this trail now and then stuff gets in the way and it just it feels very suspenseful and it's actually well moving and even though there are errors in the writing the story itself is actually decently written and it makes sense the conclusions that Nancy jumps to but there are some Nancy Drew books where she will either straight up ignore facts so I guess the reader has a chance to solve it but making her look super stupid or she'll just randomly jump to the weirdest conclusion and you wonder how the heck did you get here but in this book it feels very natural especially near the end where she comes up with oh I know where the will is because earlier in the book it was foreshadowed that oh Josiah has been hanging a lot in Masonville even though he doesn't know anybody here huh I wonder why he's doing that and then it pops up later. It's a fair mystery on that front. So my one question for the author is, I kind of wonder how much creative freedom she had. Did Edward come up to her and say, hey, this is my idea for a book. There's going to be a missing will. Nancy has to go on a treasure hunt. Her dad's a lawyer. Did he basically come to her with all of these ideas? Or did he say, hey, I want you to write a book about a teenage girl solving a mystery and she got to come up with what it was? Because if she got a lot of the creative freedom, she set up a lot of the standards for the Nancy Drew books. Now, are you talking the first person to write it or the person who rewrote it? The first person. Obviously, the rewrote person didn't have any creative freedom in that. She apparently did a little bit because there are quite a few things that she changed which did to some extent change the tone of the book. It did but I wouldn't really count that as much creative freedom. It was very obvious who the characters were, what was happening in the plot, how it was gonna end. And there were like small changes. But the first person, because this was the first Nancy Drew book ever written, I wonder how much of it she got to design herself and how much of it was told to her to write. That would be interesting to find out, yes. I guess my question would actually be for the person that rewrote it. I would want to know why she didn't fix the thing with the telephone at the beginning of the book. If she's rewriting the book, she might as well find a way to fix the whole telephone situation at the very beginning of the book. And I would want to know why that was left in. 
my only guess for that is she went chapter by chapter and not necessarily would carry things through. Like she would work on a chapter and then do something else and then work on a chapter and do something. That's the only thing I can figure. And there's even potential that she's the one who made that error because in the 1930s, having a personal line would not have been very popular. So she herself might have created that plot hole. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think of that. Gosh dang it, Harriet. Introducing plot holes. So would you read it again? Not anytime soon, but you wouldn't have to twist my arm to go through it again. I would read it. I can't wait to read these stories to my kids. I'm very excited about that. Like I said, this seems to be a really good book to have read to you Mm -hmm. when you're little versus reading it yourself. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, for sure. What is your rating? Because I'd give it finding a first clue in a scavenger hunt out of 10. It was a good beginning. I'd give it the joy you feel when you actually find a clue out of 10. That I found one sort of a feeling. (laughs) I don't have a huge number of thoughts about this book. Yeah, it's very... Exactly. It's not clean, but it's sterile. It's a little sterile. Just a bit. Yeah, I think you can tell at least two authors have gone over this book. Later books have much more personality than this, but this was a good start. Yeah, it's a good start. Thank you very much for listening today. You can keep up to date with us by checking us out on Twitter or Instagram, and you can help support our podcast by checking out our Patreon, where for just $1 a month, you can get access to our bonus episodes, where we look at the movie adaptation to some of your favorite books. This month, we're reliving our middle school days with David Warner as we look at Swindle. In addition, you can join our Discord server where we talk about all kinds of books from different genres or you can even take part in deciding what books we cover next. Join us next time when we will be exploring a classic loved by many people in the boomer age called Trixie Belden and the Secret of the Mansion written by Julie Campbell. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm Lizzie Sawyer. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time.